it's Gerald and thanks for joining me for the Jazz Space Technique Series. This installment of the series is kind of a bittersweet moment because after 51 years the Jamie Abersold Summer Jazz Workshops are finally complete. Jamie has said that he that the, this last year, 2018, was the last year that the workshops would be held under his direction and so thus ends uh, an amazing chapter of jazz education where students from all around the world come to study jazz with amazing faculty under Jamie's direction. Uh, I've been teaching at the workshops for 21 years and so I'm very sad to see them end and looking forward to whatever comes next. But for the past few years, uh, the base faculty at the Abersold Summer workshops have been kind enough to join me in making uh, compilation videos on various topics to share their knowledge and expertise with the base world at large. And this installment is no different. So for the very last year, um, there's a sort of a special treat in store. Uh, if you've ever been to the workshops, you'll know that on the very last day of bass masterclass, all of the bass faculty get together and play uh, an arrangement of blues in the closet, which includes the head of the tune. And then as a shout chorus, the Oscar Pettiford solo uh, transcribe solo and then play the head out and everyone takes a chorus or two and if you watch the uh, the little Hollywood Squares mashup at the beginning intro of this video you saw nine of the Abersold faculty um, playing this arrangement uh, during that intro and at the very end of the video the complete performance of all the jazz faculty who were present this year will be tagged on to the very end so you can hear that whole performance and see what students have been seeing for the past 20 or so years uh, if you're a base student at the Abersold workshops. One thing I should mention about that performance of Blues in the Closet by each faculty member is that you may notice that in, in each person's performance some people are anticipating the downbeat of the phrase, uh, each phrase in the, in the head portion of the song uh, on the end of four before the measure and some people are playing it right on the beat. Um, that's because uh, when we filmed these people were coming by the office really really quickly and reading the chart down as written. Um, some people, some faculty know the original recording and know that Oscar Pettiford actually anticipated each one of those phrases so they played it that way. Other faculty were just coming in and reading the chart down so when you listen to the mashup at the beginning uh, you'll hear some people anticipating and some people not um, and that's just you know the nature of the beast and filming something this quickly uh, if you check out the video at the very end uh, of all the faculty playing together you'll find out that very quickly everyone sort of followed Rufus Reed and phrased it as Rufus was playing that's just a little aside uh, about the performances in the video well this video like the other ones in the series uh, is intended to be open-ended. No rhyme intended, but um, the idea is that the topic is left-hand technique perspectives. And the idea is that great players from all over the world um, don't have exactly the same technique, whether it be right-hand technique, left-hand technique, posture, concept. In this video, you're gonna see um, eight guest basis and me um, talking about uh, our five, six minute uh, condensed version of what we try to do and what things we think are important about left hand technique. You're going to see um, uh, segments from great bassists like Rufus Reed, Lynn Seaton, John Goldsby, Doug Elmore, Natalie Boink, Ryan McGillicuddy, Bob Sinecrope, and Rich Armandi, each uh, playing the Blues in the Closet arrangement, and then also talking for a few minutes about things that they think are important about their approach to the left hand. And I think it's been really interesting putting the video together for a number of reasons. Uh, one, I learned that metronomes are not the same everywhere, so putting together the intro sequence was a little bit tricky. If you see fade-ins and fade-outs, it's not because somebody made a mistake, it's either because the metronome didn't match another metronome or there was a glitch on the iPad used to record it. But more importantly, what I learned was that uh, everybody has their own unique and personal way of playing the bass and their own unique and personal approach to left hand technique. And so you're gonna to get to hear nine people explain what they think is important about left hand technique 
and the way that they tend to approach that subject. With that said, enjoy. and this is blues in the closet right uh, and everybody's got a different take on it but for me uh, I have to work on my to me the sound is really in the left hand because that's that's where no matter what volume you play because this one is the producer but the left hand is the sound so if you play softly or you play uh, halfway or really loud uh, the left hand really should not change um, because it is really ultimately your sound. So if you can avoid uh, your hands flying, you know, uh, when I first started playing, when I played an A flat on the G string, you could read a message on my palm. And uh, at that time I was Brought, that was brought to my attention. I said, no, I didn't do that. But every time I played an A flat, uh, you, could, you could read something there. So I had to practice really trying to keep close. And I think one of the issues is uh, if you can keep, uh, uh, it's like this string and this string, which is twice as large as this string, and we tend to, a lot of people have, say, long fingers, so the tendency is to do this, to go over to the E string, because it seems to be the natural thing, especially if you have really long fingers, like Ron Carter or Stanley Clark or people like that. But what you've done is flattened out, so I try to actually do this. I pivot, trying to keep my fingers arched so, uh, and the exercise I used in, instead of this, we, everybody's fingers collapse here, always. Uh, but the tendency you don't have, you begin to uh, put a lot of pressure here in your, this part of the thumb. It begins to be really tense. And I hate pain, so consequently you have to try to relieve that. And sometimes you, the movement of your thumb can help relieve some of that tension. But instead of, uh, if I'm playing a B flat, these fingers don't fly. See if I can keep everything there, as if I had to play. So they're all down. So if you can get into practice, you can hear it pop. And then instead of doing this, I do this. I want to be able to, the bass will tell you when it's happening. It pops out. You hear that thud. Now, you don't always play this way, but you have to be able to understand what it feels like. 
And if you notice, I'm doing this, I'm pivoting. So I could actually, so here's a good exercise just to get into the idea of it. Here, 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 here. Not this, this, this. It's very obvious that's not. This is all just in the fingers, in the, but I want the whole this. So now, it's a good... pitch just and I haven't even used the producer yet so this is this is what I think is important if you could work on that so uh, and but here's the 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 one that's really I think will test you and you can test yourself is like playing an F scale you're here on the F there's the F and then the G but now I want you to keep the G and play an open A. And if you are not up, it'll be, it'll be like that. So, the D, A, G, before I move. So you begin. making a lot of sound and I haven't even used this. So if you can work on that. And that will help your sound incredibly in terms of, because look, look at this, see my fingers all, there's little dents. That's proof. Uh, but so, so then when you put this together, I teach at the University of North Texas. I'm here to talk about left hand conception and how I utilize rotation to play the bass. First of all, I start with my left hand just like you would completely relaxed down by your left side. If you think about it, your hand is curved and open. So I bring it up here. Ooh, I happened to bump into a bass. Look, this is the best hand position in the world. 
The arch is the strongest thing. Think about all of the Roman viaducts. We bring that to the base. Now, I was raised with Samandal, but I'm a recovering Samandalite. <laughs> I teach and play based on the methods of Francois Raboth. So if you want much more in-depth, please consult Raboth's methods and other books by George Vance, who worked closely with Raboth to do some other beginner books. They're fantastic. So in Samandal, I was basically raised that this creates a whole step between my first finger and my fourth finger. So when I put it up here, I have a box. And every time I play other notes, I have to shift. With the robot system and a pivot, it allows you to play more than a whole step. There is, of course, a half step between one and two, and a half step between two and four. But with the robot system, you pivot on your thumb, and I will turn around in a moment to show that, but instead of just I have a note back here and a note here. So that's the beauty of this system. And by pivoting from the front, it means that my fingers still remain basically in place and I can pivot this way. So I say sand the board. So you have this motion. It's not, it's not this. It's remaining close so that every finger is potentially on a note that it might play. From the side or the back, you'll see that my hand moves, but my thumb stays there. But notice that my thumb changes place, pointing in different directions. So if I were to play a C major scale, I'd have a whole step. I pivot back. I have the option here to go to first finger, and then four again, and then one again, and then two. So for this scale, the notes that are still in one position, according to the system, but are not in this home base are the E and the A. So in this position, I'm playing C, D, they're all in one position, but the F is there and the G is there and the B and the C are there. Looking at that from the side, Minor means that I'm going to pivot without changing this place the other direction. And if I make it melodic minor, I'll pivot here as well. So I'm doing pivot towards the fingerboard and towards the nut. That's the core of my left hand.
name's John Goldsby, and I'm going to talk to you a little bit about my left hand technique and how I think of left hand technique on the double bass. Uh, there are two places where I see uh, complications when playing the bass. One is shifting across the strings, and the other spot is shifting up and down the strings. So that means if we only stay in one position on one string, we probably wouldn't make a lot of mistakes, maybe a couple, but not too many. Uh, so the problem comes when we have to, first of all, let's think about playing in one position. I hear a lot of bass players where their hand position doesn't seem symmetrical, so they have a problem even playing those three notes in relationship, perfect relationship to each other. So if I think of a high D, that note should be C, this note is C sharp, this note is D. You see my finger here has a space between it, and this distance is equal to this distance, or actually this is a tiny bit greater because it's uh, on the upper part of the neck. So one thing I like to do to check the intonation in one stable hand position is play double stops. I'll play a D, I'll anchor the D up here, and I'll check to see if I can get a good, perfect fit with a G on the D string and a D on the G string. Now as an exercise, I'll trill back and forth with my second finger on an A flat. one trill. The next exercise is to anchor a C-sharp on the G-string and then trill back and forth between the note G and the note A on the D-string. This one's a little harder. But that should be a perfect, a major third. Sorry. And that should be a tritone, like an A7. trill I'll do is to anchor a B, uh, the note C, sorry, the note, the note C on the G string and trill back and forth between an A flat and an A. So here's a major third again, A flat and C. Here's a minor third, A and C. So I'll do these trills with the bow. trills. Uh, now let's anchor the notes uh, on the G string and then trill. I'll anchor a G with my first finger and trill between C sharp and D. Now let's anchor the note A flat between a C and a D. Now anchor the note A. So, 
train your left hand to always be in a good position when you're in one hand position. So when I end up in that position, I know that's a D, that's a G, E flat is there. confidence that I, I can play one note and then play another note in tune in one position. So that leads us to the, well, what do you have to do when you shift out of that position? Then I would suggest practicing arpeggios, and I like to practice triads up and down the bass because I feel like uh, triads are small building blocks of chords and you can combine them to make more complicated chords. But let's say we take a... pretty easy in the first position. Now I'm playing singing the root root in the third. So if I'm playing this triad, I'm going to think of the root, think of the third, think of the fifth. practice shifting in and out of positions, you need to slowly do the movements. So think of the note. You can look where the note is, jump directly to the note, you know, try and avoid sliding into notes. But and then when you're in one hand position, think about having the notes really solid and in proportion. Okay, have fun. Uh, one more exercise before I go. So this would be a great exercise, especially with the bow. Uh, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna play, starting on an A, B flat with my second finger, and then I'm gonna switch to B flat with my first finger, play B flat and B, back down, B, B flat with my first finger, B flat with my second finger, and A. So what I do is this. gives me an idea of exactly the smallest half step interval on the neck and how much I need to shift or not shift uh, to put my hand in position. Uh, I can do the same thing by playing B flat with two, B with four, B with two, C with four. B with 4, B with 1, 
C sharp with four. So the point is to be able to jump directly to a note and then have the fingering position locked in up locked in under that note. Okay, thanks for checking it out. Enjoy the rest of the video. Hi cats. See you soon. My name is Doug Elmore. I live in New Albany, Indiana, and I teach in a large string orchestra program there where I see 400 kids a day, ages 10 through 18. In addition to that, I'm the music director of the Louisville Youth Orchestra here in the metropolitan area surrounding Louisville, Kentucky. In addition to that, I'm a freelance jazz bass player, and I have a degree, a master's degree in classical bass performance. So much of what I do in playing jazz is informed by a lot of time in a practice room studying classical bass. The reason I mention that up front is that when I play, you're going to see a really strong adherence to curves in my hand. I tend to have a very squared set of knuckles, and if you can see my thumb back here, I try really diligently to keep it back here for a number of reasons. First reason, when playing ballads or long tones, you need your thumb and your fingers in a place where you can shape a good vibrato. And that can only happen when the thumb is in this great place to pivot from. So I try to keep that shape and I keep my elbow reasonably elevated for two reasons. One, to drive the vibrato. Two, when you're playing a lot of long notes, like say you're playing a bossa, To avoid that feeling of squeezing with the thumb against the fingers, I try to think of an archer pulling a string on a bow, so my back muscles are pulling a lot of this back and anchoring the string on the bass this way. So the, the way to successfully do that is to have your elbow aligned with this middle bone that goes up to your, uh, your long finger of your left hand. So the elbow is elevated and the thumb is in the back. Because of a lot of time spent with a bow in my hands, and a lot of time teaching cello players as well, I tend to keep this high on the fingertips approach when I'm playing. And I've found that it's helped me it's helped me to develop a certain economy of motion with the fingers. I try, I don't see myself often doing this 
when I'm playing high tempo stuff. Everything's in a pretty small box surrounding the neck of the bass. And then the last thing about the high elbow is, it makes for a more fluid move up into thumb position because the elbow can help lead your shifting. So for me, it's a game of curves and placement. The thumb stays firmly in the back of the neck, soft. There's a pull from the center back muscles into the hand, and I keep my fingers pretty curved 90% of the time. Now, if I'm playing a ballad and there's a really long note, I'll sort of cheat in, use the flesh of the finger, and go for a longer tone. And then that, of course, darkens the sound, softens the sound, warms the sound, and you can, you can play different colors then. That's pretty much everything that I have to say about my left hand technique in a nutshell. jazz coordinator and a lecturer at the University of North Carolina Wilmington and I'm here with you today to share some of my thoughts on left hand technique and I think one of the most important starting points for me is thinking about balancing the instrument um, the bass as you know is a very it's a large instrument it's a heavy instrument the neck compared to many of our string brothers and sisters is way thicker and so when students are struggling to just keep the instrument upright, um, it creates tension in the left arm and in the fingers. You don't really want to be holding the bass and trying to play because you're not going to be very efficient, you're not going to be very effective. But I always like to start by just thinking about balancing my feet and then getting the instrument tucked into my hip socket so that it stays put more or less and I have the freedom and the flexibility to lift my arms, to shift around the instrument and that just creates more looseness and flexibility in my hand. I don't have to worry about clenching and keeping the instrument in place. So that's kind of my first starting point. Uh, one of the things I am very fond of is being efficient in playing. And for me, that means keeping my fingers relatively close to the strings. I'm, I'm looking to keep my fingers rounded if possible, but also hovering Rather than letting individual fingers fly away, I often see the pinky kind of leading away from the neck. So if you can keep your hand shape, keep your fingers close to the strings, um, you're going to move around more quickly and you won't uh, create more tension and fatigue than necessary because bass players are often tasked with walking chorus upon chorus um, and then eventually you get to take a solo. So we want to maintain our energy levels and that means being efficient in how we press our fingers down. 
I think it also does help keep the hand relaxed. Um, we don't want to have those flyaway fingers. I do personally tend to keep my fingers spread. There are others who have more um, flexibility in, in that kind of hand position. Um, I certainly do as I extend up the instrument, depending on the length of your fingers, um, the thickness of your fingers, and your hand strength, you may have to make adjustments in terms of releasing, say, the pointer finger just a little bit so you can, can make some of the intervals. But I do tend to keep my fingers more or less in place. And there are different schools of thought on that. In terms of the sound that I'm trying to get, I really would like a fat, rounded sound most of the time. And for me, that comes from playing with the pads of my fingers. I often hear um, new players to the instrument, you get a buzzing sound, that kind of buzzing sound that's not so desirable. Um, and that's often because the string is not all the way depressed into the fingerboard. So if you've got a little air, the string is going to vibrate against the string, uh, excuse me, against the fingerboard. So keep the string pressed all the way down and use the fleshy part of the finger. You're gonna get a rounder sound rather than just being on the fingertips. Also, that, that claw is just tension right there. So if I can soften the hand shape a little bit, use the meatier part of the fingers, you're gonna get a, a nicer, fatter sound. Um, I do try to avoid collapsing my knuckles. I do have a pinky that won't stay round for the life of me. And sometimes my third finger will just collapse. If you're double jointed, your knuckles are going to collapse on you. But if you're playing a ballad and you want to have some vibrato, you want to add, if you want to add a little nice vibrato, if, you're, if your knuckles are locked and kind of pointing backwards, it's not going to be quite so successful. So I do try to keep my knuckles rounded in my left hand. I think visualization is very effective. It can be really helpful in thinking about how to apply these concepts to your, your instrument. And I like to think a lot about energy transfer and that all this energy has to come from the larger muscles into the fingertips, pressing into the string so we get that nice big sound. And how do we get that energy there? Part of it, I, I do believe, is by imagining this kind of lightning that comes through the shoulder, through the wrist, and into the fingertips. It keeps, it keeps my fingers energized. Uh, also keeping my fingers energized is just staying close. Keeping your fingers hovering close um, helps you keep that energy there. Uh, one other thing I wanted to share with you is some percussive techniques in the left hand. I enjoy playing a lot of samba with a trio that I have and I can get some really cool percussive sounds out of muting the string with my left hand. So if I were to take a little snippet, say, from Girl from Ipanema. All I'm doing is using my fingers, just resting them against the string. They're not actually playing any sort of definite pitch. It's just, if you can practice that lub-dub, 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 get that heartbeat going, you're plucking any string, but letting your fingers just rest on the string, you can get and the bass suddenly becomes a little bit more of a percussive instrument. Thank you.
name is Ryan McGillicuddy, and I'm a professor of jazz studies at Moorhead State University. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit today about uh, left-hand technique on the bass. And what I use is uh, I studied the Samandel and Raboth methods, so I use a kind of hybrid between the uh, Samandel and, and Raboth methods. Um, so with my left hand, uh, the Raboth method that I use is anchoring my thumb on the back of the neck. Um, so, for instance, if I'm playing a G major scale, all those notes in G major can be played in the space of my first finger, my second finger, and my fourth finger without really having to shift. But what happens when I have to shift, if I'm playing, let's say, an A flat, uh, A flat major scale in the first position, or second position, well, what I do is I shift back, anchoring my thumb. So my thumb, you can see right there, is anchored there. And I've already gone from this position to shifting my hand a little bit with my, my thumb anchored in the back. So, like so. Here's my G. And here's my A flat. And then I'm able to shift back like that with my thumb staying in the same place. It's a little, it looks a little awkward, but it actually feels pretty good. first position there, and then over here to second position. And then also with my left hand technique, I make sure that I, I nail down each finger. So I try to think of the tips of my fingers, uh, not the very tips, but kind of the pad right here, this, this part that you would touch a keyboard with, uh, a computer key. Um, I think of that part as being a nail, and I try to nail down the note to get a real good sound. And then also, um, another thing I want to address is uh, some good advice that was given to me uh, at one time was uh, the advice that the lazy bass player is the best player. So the less I have to move, better off I am. And, and how can you apply that to your playing with the left hand? Well, it's good to use a mirror. And uh, if, if anything is looking really awkward, and you're having to shift a lot, well, then reduce it. Reduce your shifting. Uh, make it look as effortless as possible, right? So that's another tip that was given to me that really helps. I try to make my left hand uh, be as effortless as possible. So let's say playing a G major scale, right? I want as little movement as possible in my G major scale with the left hand. And then if I'm shifting up, rather than if, if this, I, I don't want to expend energy inefficiently, right? Right, something like that. So if I'm doing that, then I want to see what I'm doing in the mirror, and then I want to make it look effortless. One more thing I did want to address uh, with the left hand technique. Um, I know it was probably one of my Achilles heels as a bass player. I, I started on electric and I moved to upright. And uh, one of the things I had to address was intonation with the left hand. And especially moving out of that first position uh, and going up the fingerboard. So one thing that really helped me. Right, so how do I find that B there? So here's my G major, G, B, D, G, and then B. Well, how did I know that B was there? Well, for me, one of the things that really helped with left hand, a left hand technique and finding these notes was to understand where that note is, I really have to get the feel of it. I don't want to look at it, I want to get the feel of it. So what do I do? So if I'm on that B, what does it feel like on my left hand? If I move my left hand around, well, my, my pinky is nailed down to that B. Well, I can feel this part of my arm is at the bout. If I go up, I can feel my thumb is, is at the heel here. Uh, and so then I, I know where that B is. And I don't have to guess. 
And so that was one of the things that really helped me with my intonation. Um, if you want to learn more about that, you can go to ryanmcgillicuddy.com, if you can spell that. Actually, I'll spell it for you. R-Y-A-N-M-C-G-I-L-L-I-C-U-D-D-Y.com. Thanks. My name is Bob Sunnicro and I'm a bass player and uh, I teach at Milton Academy. Um, founded the jazz program there 45 years ago and I also teach for Jamie Abersall. I've been here 38 years at the jazz workshop. I also teach uh, for Berkeley at the Victor Wooten weekend workshop at Berkeley College of Music and I've been playing the bass for uh, 50, 55, 56 years. Anyway, um, I don't have a, much of a formal training, uh, but I've been playing just a long time. Uh, in terms of left-hand technique, um, you know, whatever works for you, works for you. Um, you know, the claw is a way that I, I, I will offer students that, in terms of how the muscles work, this is the best way, this most efficient way. When you do this kind of thing, you just limit the flow. And I try to get people to think about playing from their shoulder and having the the strength emanate from here, and when you do the claw, which letter C is, a, uh, you just take that, drop your hand, pretend you're picking up jacks, if <laughs> anybody knows what that is anymore, and you just bring it to the base, that's sort of the most efficient way. Having said that, um, you know, you don't have to play perfect technique all the time. Uh, it, well, we just need to get the job done. I remember uh, distinctly going to a workshop at a jazz education conference a long time ago. Back, Bob Magnuson, who's a great bass player, talked about not putting too much pressure on the strings because then you get a buzz. And that, that struck me, and I remembered that. And so sometimes when I play, I like to get that little bit of buzz, so I don't. You know, but if I want to get a nice sound, I'm going to do a little bit of vibrato. Um, you know, breaking the knuckles, so to speak, when I say break the knuckles, I don't mean break them, but, um, you know, classical technique probably would have you doing that, but, you know, there's nothing wrong. You have to get the job done. That's the most important thing. Um, so, I, I really don't think about it, it's just I've done it so long. is you want to feel relaxed you don't want to put uh, pressure because if you play a long period of time if you play fast tempos 
um, you could do some serious damage to your hands. Um, so, um, and when I play fast, uh, I just try to, I don't try to load up, I, I try to load up a whole measure's worth of notes. I know this isn't all uh, left hand technique, but it actually has something to do with it. And that, I don't want to go, I go, that's how I think of it. And it just helps me relax my hands. So um, the most important thing is the sound. Are you getting the sound you want? If not, try some different things. Um, it's really cool to look at other bass players. Um, of course, with all the uh, availability online now, you can look at lots of different players. You don't have to be in person. And just try out and see what works for you. Have fun. Keep swinging. Hi there, I'm Rich Armandi. I'm uh, thrilled to be a part of Chris Fitzgerald's project here with uh, uh, his video series. And I guess this one is about the left hand. Um, with the left hand, uh, as you might have seen in my uh, portion of the video thus far, uh, I tend to use curved fingers. I like to use the tips of the fingers, uh, and sometimes the pads too. I actually, uh, I, I'm a product, I'd say, of people like Rufus Reed, Ray Brown. Also, I remember uh, getting some instruction from the great Bob Bowman. He was very much an advocate of being, being way up on the tips of the fingers. So uh, this is all to get the best sound. Little anecdote, I had the great uh, pleasure to have a lesson with Ray Brown when I was coming up. And one of the things he did was come up to me as I was playing and start pulling my fingers off the fingerboard uh, to try to uh, make it clear that we needed a very solid fretting of the string into the fingerboard. He also started asking me questions like, what's your address? What would you have for dinner? But, and that, of course, was uh, to make, make one aware of that you have to have a lot of awareness and have your mind free and open to hear everything. But that's another video. So, um, let's see. I, I ascribe to uh, keeping the, the hand at this kind of a posture, the thumb generally behind the middle finger when I shift. I am not a person who does the uh, um, uh, pivoting thing. I, I like to keep my thumb uh, together with my hand as I move up the fingerboard. Uh, so uh, I, th I think too that uh, staying on the tips for the most part uh, will get you the clearest sound and that's of course the, the whole reason why we play uh, is to get a great sound and uh, or rather that's what we need to produce in order to be um, part of the musical community. Uh, so uh, let's see, I, as, as I go we, uh, into thumb position I try to maintain using the tips of the fingers. I know a lot of guys uh, advocate letting this guy um, collapse a little. Uh, and sometimes I do it myself. I don't like to just because I want to have a consistent sound uh, no matter what. And part of it also allows me to be consistent physically as well. So
So, um, oh, yes, uh, the end pin I use also is a, a factor in, in how uh, I approach the bass. I just started using this chromatic end pin. Uh, should I? There you go. And, and what it does, it, it's sort of a, uh, a way to replicate the use of the robot end pin, if you're familiar with that. And it allows the bass to be practically uh, uh, completely, you know, uh, balanced, etc. But plus, it changes the center of gravity, so I don't have to use my thumb to hold up the instrument, and thus I can get my finger in there even better for to maintain my uh, uh, my sound and uh, the uh, consistency of my sound. So I think that's all I've got. But thank you again, Chris, for letting me be a part of this great project. Hi, I'm Chris Fitzgerald, Associate Professor of Bass at the University of Louisville. Uh, this video is about left-hand technique and for a more in-depth uh, version of my thoughts about left-hand technique on the double bass, please see my video called Left-Hand Technique Basics. Uh, earlier in the series, it's about a 45-minute video that covers about everything I could think of at the time I made the video. But today I want to talk about a couple of things. Um, the first of these is the idea about keeping the left hand very relaxed. And this may seem uh, counter to a lot of the traditional pedagogy. Um, if you come up studying some Mandel method, you are taught to basically spread your hand out and spread the whole step between one and four with the half step on two in between. your hand is already in this position of being spread out. Uh, I like to come from a very different perspective most of the time and that perspective is the idea of a relaxed hand. The relaxed hand comes from the way that your hand just naturally sits when you drop it to your side. I think Lynn Seaton mentioned this a little earlier in this video. If you just drop your left arm to your side, I'm not sure that's in the shot or not, but and then you bring it up, not only is your hand in this perfect C shape to play the bass, but if you look at your fingers, your fingers are not spread out. Uh, your fingers are actually very close together and relaxed the way that your hand is. If you drop your hand again to your side, raise it up, your fingers are close together and your hand is very relaxed. So how does that affect your playing uh, left hand technique on the bass? Well, if you simply put your hand in that position, the fingers will be too close together to actually play the notes in tune. would be out of tune. So how do you get with a relaxed hand this spacing of half step, half step, half step that you had with the Samandel spread, right? 
Well, the way that my body likes to do it, which is sort of how I came to this, was listening to my body, uh, and from studying a lot of martial arts where you try not to extend and, and stay uh, stiff and flexed and extended, rather stay relaxed. If your hand stays relaxed like this, what you do is you actually move your arm around your hand to keep it relaxed. Here again is the difference. Samandal position. Notice that when you see this, this left elbow and shoulder and upper arm don't move much at all. It's the fingers that are doing the work. With a relaxed hand position, what you see is the hand stays relaxed, but you see the elbow and shoulder moving. To, to let the hand stay in a relaxed position, but to let the arm move the finger into the position that it needs to play. One way to think about this is to take your two hands and put them in front of you and put your left hand in this traditional position where you've got this, you know, first position, whole step between one and four and half step between one and two. Now take that off the base and hold it out in front of you. Now take your other hand, drop it to your side, and then raise it up and just put it next to the hand that's in cemental position. Ask yourself which one of your hands is more comfortable right now. And for me, it's always the hand that's relaxed, not the hand that's already spread out. So the way that you might practice something like this is with this idea of choreography of your left hand. Uh, the choreography of the left hand is really more the choreography of the body. So instead of moving finger, 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 you really the choreography is of the arm and the shoulder, and then the fingers can be very relaxed. The other thing I'd like to talk about is the idea of fingertips versus finger pads. And the, uh, again, because of the relaxed hand concept that I think is very central to everything that I'm trying to do on the bass, um, playing on the fingertips feels very unnatural for me because in order to really play on the fingertips, you have to have your hand again in this curved position. And in this curved position, Again, if I just drop my right hand and hold the, the fingers up, you see that this curve position is not at all like what the hand is like when it's relaxed. So I like to keep the hand in a relaxed position, which means playing more on the pads. If I'm playing on the tips, I've got this very curved thing. Again, it's not relaxed, it's kind of tense. I take the relaxed hand, bring it up to the base, and I'm playing on the pads of the fingers. And notice with each note, the weight of the arm is all on the finger that's playing. So a lot of times in traditional playing, uh, you would start with the first finger and then keep that finger down with weight on it and pressure on it play the next note, so now there's two fingers with pressure on them. And then when you play with four, all three fingers are pressing down. With the relaxed hand technique, only the finger that is playing has the full weight of the arm on it. And so that every stop has the full weight of your arm. It's not a right or wrong technique, but it is another option um, for people to think about um, when you're exploring this idea of left hand technique. Again, for uh, an extended version of all the possibilities, check out the left hand techniques video. But those are the two things that I would mention as being uh, especially important in the context of this video. Thanks.